I'm excited to share that changes are coming on FemPower Health. To be updated on what those might be, subscribe to the podcast, and you can go to the show notes to follow me on social media, as well as subscribe to the weekly newsletter. And I promise you, no spam with the newsletters. They're always very purposeful because I am cognizant of your time and your very, very busy inbox. So stay tuned. Can't wait to share what's coming. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. With over 39 million Americans struggling with migraines, it's no wonder you all reached out to me to cover this topic. I'd like to thank the American Migraine Foundation for introducing me to Dr. Christine Lay, an expert and patient herself, as well as Nimla Alvani, a patient. This episode is really for caregivers and migraine sufferers alike. We cover the dynamics of migraines, the symptoms and how they manifest in individuals, as well as solutions. We also discuss the dynamics of the challenges in finding a provider who can help you and practical solutions for you to find relief as you are looking for that expert. The American Migraine Foundation also has built a lot of helpful tools for migraine sufferers, and I've attached the relevant links in my show notes, so be sure to check that out. Now get ready for a very informative discussion, and I hope that you are able to find the relief that you need and deserve. A lot of times we'll walk around and just say, oh, I have a migraine, but what does it really mean? And how do you know if it's a headache or a migraine and does it really matter? Definitely. There, there is a big difference. Everyone knows about a headache and headache is one of the most common human ailments worldwide. Uh, a review was done a number of years ago, looked at 110 different countries worldwide and found that headache was extremely common. However, migraine is a brain disease. And one of the clinical symptoms of migraine is a very disabling, often moderate or severe headache, but it's associated with a number of other brain or neurological symptoms. And that really distinguishes migraine as a very unique entity compared to something like tension type headache, which is exceedingly common, the most common type of headache worldwide, but it's rarely disabling. It often does not interfere with one's ability to function or to get through their day uh, compared to a migraine, which is a neurological brain disease that's incredibly disabling. Uh, Many great treatments available, but if you don't have the right diagnosis and you don't have the right treatment, it really can be life altering. Can I ask a a clarification question? Because the nuance I'm hearing is that it is debilitating. When you say debilitating, what does that mean? And then the other question I had is frequency. So for example, like I'm in perimenopause and it's known that once you get into this stage of life, migraines do tend to happen. And so can someone have one once in a while? Does it happen all the time? And I'm more saying this from a perspective of Mm -hmm. I'm a patient. What I've seen consistently with how I've been monitoring how patients react to seeking help it's usually I'm suffering with something and getting the right diagnosis is often hard. Like a broken arm, we know, go to the ER, get your cast. But with everything else, there's so many nuances. So if I have this headache, you know, is it a migraine? Does it happen all the time? What else do I need to know about it to then figure out where do I go next? When I was first experiencing what I thought was just severe headache, It was to the point where I wanted to hit my head against the wall. I did not know what was happening. I couldn't understand why I couldn't get up out of my bed from this debilitating pain that I was feeling on one side of my head. It was at my left hand side of my head. I also noticed my face was tingly and numb. numb. Um, I couldn't stand bright lights. 
the room had to be extremely dark, extremely cool. Otherwise I felt like anything else would exacerbate what I was experiencing. I couldn't eat certain things when I was experiencing an attack or sometimes even my vision. I couldn't take anything that was moving in my peripheral in front of me. So I would just be sitting in my dorm room with the cover over my head. What took me to the point of diagnosis was eventually I noticed my attacks mimic what I thought were stroke symptoms, right? And my friends were like, you really need to go to the hospital. Your face is drooping and your arm is, you know, doing this weird cramping thing. And I wasn't even aware that it was, those things were happening. Fortunately, it was not a stroke, but I went through a long um, period in the hospital where I went through the emergency room. They treated me as if I was having a stroke went through all of the testing, and then I was discharged with consultation to neurology, connected to a neurologist. And that's when I was diagnosed with hemiplegic migraine, which was a subtype of migraine and a rare subtype of migraine. So to answer your question about debilitation, it can be different for everyone. It's just a very varied disease across individuals. Even within one individual, no two attacks could be identical. But the key features from the experience is your life is really disrupted when you're having an attack, the lead up to an attack, and even the recovery from the attack. And there are certain phases that Dr. Lay can talk about to understand those moments that when they're happening. Many times people that think you associate migraine with severe head pain, but there's also people who don't get the head pain, but get everything else that's associated with migraine. Migraine is very variable amongst different patients, and it's also variable within an individual. So there are some people that have one migraine their entire life, and there are other people that live with a migraine attack every day. And it is a spectrum. Nim just described her story, which is common in the sense that it took a while to get the diagnosis and took a while to get the right medication. Her form is much more rare. A more common form is more typically uh, someone in the uh, full-blown part of a, a migraine attack will have a severe headache. It's debilitating because one of the diagnostic criteria is you can't get done what you need to get done. You might be bed bound. 80% uh, of individuals during a migraine attack are unable to function. Uh, another sort of smaller percent are uh, able to get uh, you know, most of what they need to do done, but the majority of patients are really finding it hard to function. So even moderate um, activity, light housekeeping, uh, driving your children to a soccer game, getting your work done at the office, uh, making social plans with friends can be ruined because of these migraine attacks. And headache is one component of it, but just as Nim described, there are all these other neurologic features, intolerance to light, intolerance to sound, intolerance to smell, even intolerance to touch. Many patients in the midst of a migraine attack will say, men will say, I gotta take my necktie off. Or women will say, I had to take my glasses off. I had to take my ponytail out. I, I couldn't stand the tag in the back of my clothing. I just had to take my socks off. Like everything was very bothersome. We call that cutaneous allodynia. And then in addition, there can be these neurologic features of tingling, numbness, paresthesias, more rarely like NIM, individuals will have weakness. But in general, patients during a migraine attack will say, I had a hard time finding the right words. I had a hard time coming up with the ability to balance my checkbook. I, I went into the kitchen to get something and two hours later, I was in the laundry room doing something else and completely forgot that I had to unload the dishwasher. So there could be some degree of confusion associated with this episode. And that's where the terrible stigma comes in for individuals with migraine, because it's thought of as just a headache. And even well-meaning coworkers or family or friends will say, oh, I, I have some over-the-counter medicine. I get headaches too. Here, take this. You'll be fine. But migraine is so much more than just a headache. And it requires very targeted and specific therapies, lifestyle therapies, vitamin therapies, mindfulness, meditation, wellness, acute therapy, as Nim mentioned, and that's a medication an individual will take as an attack is coming on to turn it off, to stop it in its tracks. And there are also medications that people will take on a daily basis in an oral formulation to prevent the episodes or make them less burdensome, less severe. And then we have newer therapies available, which are wonderful targeted therapies for individuals with migraine. And that's a once a month injection or once every three month injection to be given at home. And there's also an intravenous one available now. And we have many new migraine medications on the horizon. So it's a really great time for people who suffer with migraine because there's so much hope right now. Wow. 
So one thing that strikes me, so first, Nim, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. And I can't even imagine what it's like to live with this, especially when you don't always know what to expect. Absolutely. Yeah. Chronic conditions are just so hard. Um, and I, I feel like I am starting to spend a lot more time talking about them because uh, they're the, the ones that are true mysteries. So one of the things that strikes me is not having a headache. Is that common? It's more rare. It's, it's okay. much more common in individuals who are older. We call it acephalgic migraine, which is okay. just as Nim described, they have a lot of the migraine features, but not the headache. Uh, there are other individuals who have what we call vestibular migraine, which is an imbalance in the vestibular balance system of the brain. And these are individuals that will feel like they have vertigo or they're off balance or they're spinning or they're nauseated and unwell, but the headache is very mild. Uh, other individuals more commonly will have a pretty severe or at least bothersome headache as part of the migraine attack. But the acephalgic migraine, a little bit more common in the older individual, but certainly we do see it across the ages. And that makes it hard to diagnose if you're thinking migraine is just a headache. I mean, I think the other thing people would be surprised to hear or learn is migraine does not discriminate against age, uh, race. It doesn't discriminate discriminate against gender. While it is predominantly and prevalent in females, that doesn't mean men don't get it or children don't have it. And, you know, so it's very interesting to see that full spectrum and even how individuals will probably not get diagnosed till later in life, but when they finally are diagnosed later in life, they look back and recognize what I was living with all of those years and people couldn't figure out or understand why I was so sensitive to my gym class that was so loud during high school or junior high school. And then I realized later in life that was because I was living with migraine and nobody thought to diagnose me. And that's one of the things that, you know, the American Migraine Foundation is trying to hone in on is really educating all populations and subpopulations about recognizing migraine as a disease and disorder of the brain and when to seek help. Because, you know, there are many individuals who've taken decades to get to a diagnosis and they've had everything from a sinus diagnosis to having their teeth pulled because they thought the pain that's originating in their face area was related to dental issues when really and truly it was a headache or a migraine feature that they weren't sure of. And, you know, there is a lot of work to be done. As Dr. Lay said, there's a lot of stigma that the 1 billion people worldwide face when living with migraine, not only from a personal interpersonal level, meaning as the individual, they feel embarrassed to talk about this debilitating experience because they don't want to be seen as irresponsible or complaining. That means that that affects their relationships with their partners, with their families, with their loved ones, their children. They feel like they're not reliable or they're not showing up 100%. But then that gets carried over into the workplace. And if there's not an understanding work environment that understands accommodations for invisible illnesses, then you're talking about managers who won't give you that flexible work schedule, who won't dim the light above your cubicle or in your office. And that just, you know, carries on and carries on. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of healthcare professionals who don't understand migraine. And that stigma is worse when there's only about 700 headache specialists in the United States. And there's 39 million people in the United States with migraine. That wait list is very long to get into specialty care. So if you're seeing a primary care provider that doesn't understand migraine, you know, you get a compounding that experience, that stigma, that length to diagnosis. So then let's get into diagnosis. And, you know, it, there's probably two buckets of people who are listening to this. I have a migraine. I know I have a migraine. I can't get help. Or I have something going on and I need to figure this out. Um, so I definitely want to make sure we get to solutions as well. So from just the diagnostic pathway, how should someone approach this? Because typically the path is in our healthcare system, you have to go through your primary care provider, and then usually there's a referral. And in some cases you go to the specialist and depending on the type of specialist they do or don't take insurance, sometimes you can go directly to a specialist. So there's all these different dynamics. So not only the pathway, but the diagnostics, because some of the things you're saying, it could be a variety of conditions. And so 
one of the things I'm noticing in um, the, the trend with chronic conditions is people can take, you know, a decade, two decades, three doctors, 20, I think the most I've heard is a woman took 21 doctors to be diagnosed with celiac. So, you know, I don't think it matters the condition, but I would like to know specifically for someone who's suffering from these types of symptoms, how do they get the answer? And then we can get into what are the solutions. And to be fair, because of the wait list, it would be great to talk about solutions of you're waitlisted, you're suffering, what do you do now? Once you get to the doctor, what do you do to get your resolution as quick as possible? The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself and you have to be prepared. And everyone who thinks they might have migraine is suffering with disabling headaches really needs to go to the American Migraine Foundation website. There are a ton of tools there to help you prepare, to help you be organized, to help you track your headaches, to track your symptoms so that when you get to that primary care provider, you are prepared and you understand what your story is. You know, we, we don't wanna rain on the parade of the primary care provider. Um, the average medical school has about four hours of teaching on headache, not migraine, on all headache disorders across four years of medical school. So we are continuing to graduate uh, physicians from medical school programs who have an empty toolbox when it comes to managing headache and migraine. And we're trying to change that. We're advocating, we're increasing programs at the University of Toronto. We've introduced sort of mandatory education in the medical school program, which is, which is helping. But when you get to see your doctor, uh, your doctor may or may not be familiar with how to diagnose migraine, but it's pretty simple to diagnose. You need someone who's got headaches, that generally they're recurrent over time. So not someone who's had one headache because in order to make the diagnosis of migraine, you need to have had five attacks. The headache itself might be throbbing, but it might be steady and dull. It might be pressure-like. So the quality is important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, as Nim described earlier, she had a one-sided, a unilateral headache, but close to 50% of migraine attacks, the headache component can be a bilateral or two-sided headache. So track the kind of pain you're feeling, where it is in your head. But the most important feature of a migraine attack is that it's, it's moderate or severe. This is not a mild headache that we're talking about. And as I said earlier, it interferes with your ability to function. So those are the two most important points of that first box. A throbbing, one-sided, moderate, to severe, interferes with my ability of function. The two most reliable are the latter two. Interferes with my ability to get my work done during the day, whatever that work might be, but even if it's social and, and activity, and then it's moderate. And the other box has to do with associated neurologic features. And you need to have some degree of light and sound intolerance or some degree of loss of appetite, nausea, and about 20% of patients with migraine will actually be vomiting. If you have two from box A and one from box E, so someone who says, I have this bifrontal pressure pain, it's hard for me to function, I'm staying at work because I've run out of sick days, but I'm really not getting everything done, and I'm looking for medicine to take, and yes, I wish I could dim the lights, as Nim said, I wish I could, you know, get my neighbor to stop typing because the sound is driving me crazy, that's migraine. It can be fairly straightforward to diagnose, and there are a number of tools available through the American Migraine Foundation, but also uh, patients can also help their physician. The American Headache Society has a number of great tools for that primary care provider. And I would say the majority of primary care providers are willing to work with you, but don't go into your annual visit and say, my asthma is good, this is good, this is good. By the way, I have these bad headaches, can we talk about them? Make an appointment specifically to talk about your headaches. Yeah, and, and let me ask you this, is that, because of the coding that has to be done uh, through the insurance companies? Or like, why would you uh, specifically say make an appointment specific time. to migraine? Time. time. So the average primary care doctor may have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you do not want to spend nine of those minutes on your other health ailments okay. or your wellness. You really want that time dedicated to talking about your headache, your migraine. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Because I actually yeah. did an interview um, with an expert her company is actually called How to Talk to Your Doctor. And we spoke about how to talk to your doctor. And that was one of the tips is be very specific, go in for one thing. And if there are two things, so for example, if you need the wellness visit plus a headache discussion, call the doctor's office and try to book a double 
if not book two different appointments. So thank you for, I just wanted to make sure I understood why. Sure. So as you're talking it, and, and maybe I'm oversimplifying, but it sounds like the, cause when I heard 700 specialists, 39 million suffering in the U S I'm thinking, how is anyone going to be helped? But what you're alluding to is upfront. If the patient is educated and monitoring their symptoms and speaks in the right way to their doctor, they don't have to wait for the long list. So two questions there. One, did I understand that right? And the solutions can happen earlier. And if the answer is yes, then what's the difference between the help you would get at a primary care? And when is it time to be referred to the expert? Like what's the difference? Yes, we don't want to simplify it. But if you're prepared, you have the right information, you have a primary care physician that can work with you, you can at least get the ball rolling, get the diagnosis and start some therapy. Exactly. And so the key piece that Dr. Lay was communicating is the preparation. Because there isn't a diagnostic test for migraine, like there would be for diabetes or high cholesterol, it's really important as a patient or as someone who believes they have migraine or some type of headache disorder to go in prepared with that information. And there are many, many resources um, from the American Migraine Foundation or other patient organizations that's called a headache diary. There are e even mobile apps that help you capture this information. And that's the data that a provider is really gonna wanna hone in on. They wanna learn about what is exactly you're experiencing as Dr. Lay said, where is the pain? When do you notice that this is happening more, most often? Is it when you're waking up in the morning or is it right before bed? Does it happen only on the weekends? And that's a whole other topic in migraine, right? It's called let, let down migraine, headache, et cetera. But it's those key details that are gonna help the provider hone in on, on what you're speaking about and maybe take them away from thinking it's a sinus headache or allergy and bring them closer to a migraine diagnosis. But if you go in unprepared and you don't know the words to describe what you're experiencing, you're then casting this wider net. And that's where that longer time to diagnosis, getting to an accurate treatment pathway, or any of those things that happen when someone is delaying the process. One of the other pieces about getting to diagnosis and the difference between speaking to a primary care provider versus when it's time to go to a headache specialist. Primary care providers are well equipped to deal with a long list and spectrum of diseases, whether chronic or acute diseases. And one of the things is getting to a headache specialist is when it becomes a bit more challenging to navigate, meaning not responsive, what's in the toolbox of the primary care provider is not working and you're still at that state that you were in one, two, three, four, five, six months ago. That's when that triage happens and says, I think it's time to see a neurologist and, or I think it's time to see a specialist, like a headache specialist, to really dig into what you may be experiencing. So it's not that you're, you shouldn't go to a headache specialist. It's just, you should start with a provider, usually your primary care provider. And then that conversation will help determine what can be done in that moment or whether you need to move on to a specialist for a deeper look into what's happening. And one of the things to help prepare for a visit, the American Migraine Foundation has a scripting tool. It's something you can print out and it helps you identify the goals that you're trying to accomplish from that visit with any provider. It doesn't have to be a specialist or a PCP. What you're experiencing, so a condensed version of a headache diary, and then tips and tricks on how to get the conversation going, what questions you should be asking, how you should be presenting your experience, that way, a patient, like you said, there may be one or two different buckets of individuals listening to you right now. The group that thinks, I am experiencing something, I think it might be migraine, but I have no idea how to describe it, that tool exists for that reason. As we're talking, one of the things we didn't cover in understanding migraines is root cause. And so one of the things that I really like to do in the podcast is understand the why, because, you know, I think in our society, we've become very quick fix. I think social media has just exacerbated. We want answers right away. We want to do something right away. We want to fix it right away. 
FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. What are some of the, so well, let me bucket this out. There's probably causes and then there's probably triggers. So why does it start in the beginning? And then what are the things that make it keep happening repeatedly? And with that, does that also impact treatment? So as an example, again, my understanding, um, cause I've actually had it with perimenopause, a couple of what I would think are migraines. And I honestly haven't done anything about it because I assume it's hormonal. And I try to just manage the things to stabilize my hormones and I get them less often. And so I guess I'd love your reaction to the causes versus triggers, causes and triggers and trying to solve for that and then when layering on different medications, and I, I think even on when I asked on social media, you know, people talked about eye strain, hormones, dehydration were some of their triggers. And you know, they've had success with you know, different types of drugs, changing their diet. One person had a celiac disease and they finally got diagnosed. Some have used CBD and peppermint essential oil. Now, from what you're saying, I would think these don't solve in all cases, and it may be more for headaches in some of the cases, um, but I'd love to just, you know, help educate everyone on this cause trigger and then how that drives the solution. There are triggers which may not actually be triggers anymore. Uh, you know, if you go back centuries, headache was thought of as a nuisance. Um, even individuals who are suffering with migraine were told they were stressed out. Um, Kennedy, President Kennedy had migraine, but it was hidden from the country at the time because at that time it was believed to be a condition of women who didn't cope well or women who got stressed out or women who were nervous and anxious. You know, the science has exploded over the last 40 years and especially over the last 10 or 15 years. And we truly understand now that this is an inherited condition for the most part. There are more than 100 genes that have been linked to migraine. Uh, if one parent has migraine, each child has probably at least a 75% chance of inheriting the gene and getting migraine. So it's inherited. There are a number of different genes. There are a number of different compounds that have been identified, most importantly and recently CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is present in everyone, but it's been found in individuals with migraine during a migraine attack, the levels go up very high. And after they take a medication to turn off the migraine attack, the CGRP levels normalize. But the importance behind the science is that it has led to this tremendous understanding of migraine as a biologic neurologic disease. And now we have targeted therapy for migraine. The piece about triggers and cause. So many migraine patients will tell us and then we'll know from the American Migraine Foundation interaction with patients, oh, the perfume caused my migraine. Uh, the bright light at work caused my migraine. That may not be the case. What we're beginning to understand, and we've known for a long time, but we're really honing in on it now, is that migraine is a process. There's the headache phase but before the headache begins, there's this prodrome phase. There are a number of different changes in brain and body chemicals that are going on. And one of those changes that takes place is cravings for sweet things. So many individuals will reach for chocolate or a cookie or a cupcake and then say, oh, I shouldn't have had that piece of chocolate. It caused my migraine. But in fact, the, the desire to eat that sugary food may have been part of the prodrome. It may also be during the prodrome that you know, it wasn't suddenly a bright light. It wasn't suddenly a louder coworker. It wasn't suddenly that someone sprayed perfume, but now your brain is vulnerable. There's a vulnerability during this prodrome phase. You know, I could be sitting here now and be fine. And then in a few minutes, start to get a migraine because I also have migraine and, and blame it on uh, the lights or something. Nobody made the light brighter. Nobody made the noise louder, but now my brain is aware of it. 
and my brain is unable to filter it out as unimportant information. So these triggers may not be causes, they may be part of the prodrome. There are definitely causes, weather changes for sure, hormonal changes for sure, not staying well hydrated, drinking the wrong things, drinking sugary drinks or colored juices, too much caffeine, too much alcohol, but not all triggers are true causes. So given that, so you've gone to your doctor, what are the types of solutions that they can offer? So like natural ones, um, medications, like what, what would that protocol look like? And then also the approach. So I'm assuming none of us want a list of 20 things we now have to do. <laughs> we want to phase the approach. So even, even if you have something like that on what's the layering of, of how things work. And again, I know it's by patient, there's probably going to be unique factors. So I, I do want you to also qualify that because like, I know I'd struggled with infertility and I will tell you, I was that person. Anytime I found something new, I layered it on, I layered it on and I would, you know, talk to my doctor. And sometimes I admittedly made my own judgment call because I was desperate. So I can only imagine someone living with migraine, anything they see online, you know, they'll try it. So maybe you can give us the safe and optimal way of kind of how that process works. Before we go into the, you know, the treatment pathways and, you know, one of my favorite things about being in this space and getting to work with the experts is there's certainly an all-inclusive approach to patient care, more so than I've, I've observed in other disease states. Um, and they think about everything. They do think about the complementary approach. They do think about the psychological approach as well. And in addition to the standard therapies like oral therapies and injectables, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, Dr. Lay will definitely give you some great insight to that. One of the things that I want to address is there is so much information on the internet about anything. You type it in, you can find basically anything you're looking for and to confirm the angle of what you're looking for that information, right? So at the American Migraine Foundation, we sort of did a roundup and fact about migraine that's circulating on the internet, which I think is a great place to start, right? The reason why we are emphasizing the American Migraine Foundation is we are connected to the American Headache Society, which is the leading premier professional organization of neurologists, headache specialists, and researchers. And all of the information that makes it onto the AMS website has been created and vetted by the experts in the field and meant for patient consumption. So it's very easy to read and it's very timely. So I highly encourage individuals to learn about the myths and the facts about treatment for migraine. And, you know, there's a popular one that was going around about the chip clip on your, between your thumb and your pointer finger. And another one about cream of tartar, et cetera. So just really ensuring that you're not putting yourself at risk by trying every old wives tale that comes across your social media or your internet searches and just validating that with the experts in the space and going to AMS website. Also, there's a very helpful mnemonic called SEED. And Dr. Lay, if you wanna explain SEED just to kind of get people through what are some things they can do at home? And then maybe you can, uh, again, address what the usual pathway is when providers are treating patients. Yeah, I think it's a great point. When, when patients come to see us, and this is true of, of the majority of my colleagues, you take a really thorough history, you find out about their other health conditions, and you really take a deep dive into lifestyle, which is which is part of the seed. So for example, um, you know, we wanna know, your, your patient and your listener had mentioned um, hydration as an issue. So we want to know about what are you drinking? How often are you drinking? People are not camels. You can't come home at the end of a work day and say, oh, I, I didn't have anything to drink. I'll just drink a bunch of water and everything will be fine. You really have to drink throughout the day. We really encourage hydration. If, if there's no other issues, kidney or otherwise, there you go. Uh, a liter and a half to two liters of water. Be mindful of your caffeine. Be mindful of the kind of caffeine you have. Be mindful when you have your caffeine. Be mindful whether it's you know decaffeinated or regular. And what are you putting into your coffee? Um, one individual comes to mind who is drinking two cups of coffee daily, 
regular size coffee, but you know, we found out they were putting in all this artificial sweetener and artificial creamer in the coffee. We got rid of that. And their migraine dropped dramatically. So uh, hydration is key. Um, what are you eating? In my practice, I don't put patients on strict diets for migraine. There are a number of available, as Nim said, you can read about the myths on uh, the American Migraine Foundation because it's very helpful. Um, some providers will say, you know, give up these foods and your migraine will improve. I'm a bit more of a holistic approach because I know as having migraine myself, that bananas might be a trigger for me, but they're probably only a trigger if my period is due or the weather change because triggers build on each other. I describe it to patients like you're climbing up a set of stairs. If you get to the landing, you're gonna turn on a migraine. And maybe there's there's one step that's a big step that does it. You, you're horrendously sleep deprived and had to give a huge presentation, that's enough. But for other individuals or at other times, it's the weather changed and my period was due and I ate that banana. Or for some individuals, there are certain drinks that will do it to certain foods. So be mindful of those. Be aware of those, but I don't necessarily obsess over them. All of us generally think about whole foods being best. And I usually say to patients, fresh is way better than frozen, which is a little bit better than canned and boxed. So if you want to have a particular food, can you make it at home? Can you buy a version in the store that isn't full of additives and colors? Because additives and colors can be problematic for patients. Sleep is really important. Uh, as a nation, we are completely sleep deprived. And many people pride themselves on this. They'll say, oh, I hardly need any sleep. I go to bed at two, I'm up at six, I'm checking the markets and this and that. But uh, one of the most potent risk factors for later life dementia and cognitive decline is poor sleep. So we find out what time you go to bed. Are you on your phone before you go to bed? Are you watching a Netflix really intense, powerful show that's gonna keep you up at night? How long does it take you to fall asleep? Once you fall asleep, do you stay asleep? When you wake up, do you feel refreshed? Are you napping during the day? Because these could all lead to a true underlying diagnosis of a sleep disorder, sleep apnea, restless legs, something like that. But the vast majority of migraine patients, we found it in our group and it's it's been published numerous times, that many, many individuals with migraine have very poor quality sleep. And it isn't necessarily a specific diagnosis of sleep apnea, but very fragmented quality sleep. And so if you can really work on your sleep, your sleep routine, get rid of the phone within an hour before bed, have a, a good sense of, you know, what your room is like, is it a nice cold temperature? And just as Nim was saying, you know, in your calendar, you may find, why do I always have a migraine on a Saturday? Like what's going on? Well, it could be post-stress letdown. So we would say to a patient on a Friday, hydrate really well, make sure you're eating well, get out for an afternoon break, get out into nature, listen to nature, feel nature, smell nature, hear nature. And Saturday morning, don't sleep in. Because when you sleep in on a weekend, even one hour beyond your routine weekday wake up time, you set yourself up for a migraine attack. And so very commonly migraine patients will have uh, Saturday, Sunday, or a Monday headache and think, oh, I must hate my job or I must hate my life. Monday morning, I always have a terrible migraine, but it might be your sleep. Dr. Lay, correct uh, me if I'm wrong in this. I don't know. I guess it's more of a community talk rather than based in clinical talk, but migraine brain likes to be very routine, meaning yes. that's why the extra hour of sleep on a Saturday or Sunday could potentially put, you know, bring on a migraine attack. Is that true? For sure. I, I think routine is critically important for the migraine brain. And a lot of migraine patients will say, well, that's so boring. I don't want to live by routine, but there are certain things that are more critical for routine and sleep happens to be one of them. I, I do have patients cheat on a weekend. By that, I mean, they will get up at their routine 6.30 or 7 a.m., have a little bit of protein and then go back to bed or they'll have a little bit of coffee because they're used to morning coffee and then go back. But if you just sleep through, just exactly as Nim said, that extra hour can be a killer. And so if you can stick to a routine and avoid this daily sort of disabling, ruining my weekend event of a prolonged migraine attack, why not do it? Why not get up at that routine time and avoid the migraine attack altogether? I agree. I, I think honestly, regardless of what you have, the body craves a routine, but you know, I, I think a migraine will certainly be a, a, a motivating factor. Um, so thank you for sharing. What I've noticed, though, is we haven't discussed medication at all yet. There's been so many 
foundational solutions where honestly, if I were to hear this, I would say, I don't even have to go to my doctor quite yet. Let me try all these things. So talk to us about where, you know, these other treatments come in, because I'll give you an example. I interviewed someone. It was actually a fascinating interview. When it goes live, you have to listen to it. She's using her economics background and she built all these models to find out trigger foods. And um, Mm -hmm. it's been helping cure a lot of conditions for people when they're finding the trigger food. And she said some patients that work with her, they'll say, I know that alcohol is a trigger, but I'm not giving it up. So I'd rather take the medication and drink my alcohol. So that's like a choice that they're making. And so, you know, I'd love to know kind of this pathway of when the medications are needed. Is it, you know, if you do all these healthy things, it goes away. Is it in some cases you need the medication no matter what, like where, where do these next steps fit into the picture? I think the the lifestyle, the seeds, as Nim was saying, uh, peace and, you know, exercise, sleep and eating and stress management, all those pieces, keeping a diary of your headaches, uh, they really help reduce the number of attacks, the frequency. They can help with the severity of the attack um, and, and the duration of the attack. But the vast majority of individuals with migraine are going to need at least an acute therapy. That is a medication they take as the attack is coming on to turn it off and shut it down because untreated, a migraine can last three days. So even if there's an individual who says, I don't want any drugs, I'll just suffer through. I usually say to them, you know what? The more migraine your brain has, we do have evidence to suggest that the worse this condition will get over time. So we wanna stop it in its tracks. We wanna turn it off. Um, If acute therapy isn't enough and that you may find your Your primary care provider has a toolbox of these two or three medicines they're comfortable with and they're not working, then you need to be referred on to a specialist. There may be an individual who says, you know what, I have this and it works, but I have like NIM six, seven, eight, 10, 15 attacks a month, then you need preventative therapy. And your primary care provider may or may not be comfortable with prescribing. They may be comfortable with one or two, but again, then a referral is needed to the specialist. Right now, um, we have targeted therapy based on that CGRP molecule that we talked about, which makes it incredibly exciting for individuals, you know, as a provider and and them as a patient has experienced this. uh, Well, you know, um, I do have these targeted therapies I give you, but first we have to fail this blood pressure pill, this antidepressant pill, this anti-seizure pill, because the insurance mandates it. And it's really unacceptable. If we have targeted therapy for a medical neurologic condition, we should be able to prescribe it first. I know. I I give a talk, actually, I've been giving it, and I'm hoping to expand on talking about the dynamics of the healthcare system and how it's negatively impacting so many parties because people aren't thinking of the system. So yeah, I hear you. Okay. So I I know that I want to be respectful of your time. I do have one quick question based on something you said, and then we'll get into closing. Why does this not work between the thumb and the finger? I've heard it so many times too. Where did it come from and why doesn't it work? I mean, I think for migraine, I can see why. Is it just for headaches or is it just a wife's tale that it doesn't work for anything? I don't know. I mean, Dr. Lay, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there is psychosomatic things that people will do to distract from pain. It doesn't have to be just migraine or headache. It could be anything you're dealing with, right? So it's like that joke that says, oh, my ear hurts when I stick a pen in my ear. Well, don't stick the pen in your ear right. type of thing, right? Okay. So when it comes to certain things, I think it's anything to distract from the issue at hand. And I also think there may be some acupressure, acupuncture, which we do recommend. We do say you should try other alternative therapies and mechanisms. The whole thumb and all of that, Dr. Lee, I don't know exactly why. I think for us, it's not well-researched and we'll never okay. promote anything that's not well-researched or studied. But for the most part, it's fine if it works for you okay. and it's something that you're not hurting yourself and your doctor is aware that when you go home and you have a migraine attack and you're putting pressure on your thumb, sure. The reason why AMS and I would say this and providers would say this is if you want to do that, just know there's no research to back that up. Okay. And we can't promote this as something that's well researched and understood. Okay, and the brain sense. is very powerful. The placebo response has been proven over and over again in MRI studies that it does something. Even when you say to a patient, I'm about to give you a sugar pill for this particular condition, there's a change in the brain. So the placebo, and just surprised. as Nim said, that if it works for you, there's no science behind it, but you're not doing any harm 
That's okay. the critical piece. So typically my last question is, what is your greatest hope for women's health? And so real quick, we didn't talk about the prevalence of migraine in women versus men. I know in the beginning, the myth was only women get it. Um, so what is the prevalence? And then I'll ask you the question that I typically ask in a little bit of a different way. Three to one, women really? to men. Okay. Okay. So it is still more prevalent. After, okay. after puberty. After puberty. Yeah. It. It's Before one in puberty. five women. Yeah. Yep. One in five women in the United States and one in 16 men, if that's also helpful. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So now last question is what is... So you can answer it in either way. So what I think would be interesting is both, what is your greatest hope for the future of migraines and, or what is like the coolest research that's what's being looked at to be able to help people even more? So how, whatever you think is most relevant based on what you know, I think those would be two interesting questions. So I'm incredibly hopeful right now. There are so many different migraine targets on the horizon. We have devices now. You can put an, a device on your arm to help turn off a migraine attack. I mean, it's just incredibly fascinating. So there's device therapy, there are these targeted new medications, but I, I think my hope is that um, women in particular who are to suffer with migraine will feel empowered and educated and confident to go and speak to their provider. And I hope, uh, the more AMF educates, the more AHS educates, the more medical schools that we educate physicians, that they will then meet a provider that goes, wow, that must be really, really tough for you. And I'm going to make your life better. Because when you look at neurologic conditions, headache is just about the only one, whether it's cluster, hemicrania continua, or a migraine thing, that you can actually change someone's life. You can turn it around with the right therapy. That's pretty incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Nim, do you have anything to add to what Dr. Lay shared? I do, I do. My hope for the future is a lot like what Dr. Lay said. I hope that all patients feel empowered, but women in particular, you know, I really want women to feel like they're empowered, that they have the tools, they can talk about what's going on with them. I think historically, um, women have been sidelined in many arenas of our lives, whether it's the workplace or balancing work and at home personal life and commitments and finding that time and space to recognize I'm not okay. I need to speak to someone and taking the time to do so. A woman's body is complex. A woman's experience is complex. And we now have tools to understand that complexity as Dr. Wei said. This is a disease we can turn around someone's life if they get in soon and if they communicate and advocate for themselves. So thank you for what both of you are doing. This has been Excellent. enlightening. And I, I love that it's a holistic way of, of thinking. And um, just thank you for what you do. And I just can't believe so many people have to suffer through it. So one thing we didn't touch upon that we maybe should try to make a comment on is that sure. women of color have historically been discounted as their pain not being real or their pain being much less than it really is. And so mm -hmm. this is hugely problematic for these women who are suffering with migraine. So American Migraine Foundation, American Headache Society is working very hard to empower these women uh, because it's mostly women and to work with providers and to work with uh, businesses and right now, the American Migraine Foundation is working with Black-run businesses to educate people, to empower people, to be able to stand up and to be heard and to be believed. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. 
Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. And that wraps up another empowering session here at the FemPower Health Podcast. Now, before you dash off, I've got a quick, exciting invitation for you. Please join our vibrant community by subscribing to our weekly newsletter, because it's really your frontline update on groundbreaking women's health research, the latest health-enhancing products, fun quizzes to boost your health IQ, and unique discoveries that you won't want to miss. All of this delivered straight to your inbox, cutting through the noise of social media algorithms. Love today's insights? Show your support by rating and reviewing our podcast. Your feedback is more than just a pat on our backs here at FemPower Health. It lights the way for others seeking guidance and community in their health journey, amplifying the voices that need to be heard. And for a deeper dive into today's topics, check out the show notes and explore our website at fempower-health.com. Our site is a treasure trove of knowledge, neatly categorized by topics of interest and life stage ensuring you find exactly what you need to empower your health journey. And your voice matters to us deeply. Whether you have a question, a story to share, or feedback on our episodes, reach out directly at info at fempower-health.com, drop us a message on social media, or hit reply on any newsletter. Your insights inspire our conversations. And a quick note, the knowledge we share is here to embolden you in discussions with your healthcare provider. It's not medical advice. Always consult with your doctor for health decisions. And remember, the diverse perspectives of our guests reflect their individual journeys, and it's not an endorsement by FemPower Health. Here's to empowering your health journey one episode at a time, and I'll see you on the next FemPower Health podcast episode.